it's my pleasure to introduce today our seminar speaker, Michael Case. So Michael is an assistant professor here at the uh, Robotic Institute at CMU, and he is working on probabilistic methods for robot detection. In particular, he focuses on efficient algorithms for robot localization uh, and navigation and mapping. And before he joined uh, CMU in 2013, he worked as a postdoc and a research scientist at the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab at CMU. He, did, uh, he earned his PhD at um, Georgia Tech and he was one of two runner-ups for the 2012 Volts um, Dissertation Awards for the best US PhD thesis and robotics and automation and he also was a runner-up for several ICRA awards. And he will talk today about his work on vector graphs for robot reception. All right, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so today I'm going to talk about factor graphs for robot perception. And uh, just in case my voice stops walking uh, after a short time, since I have a cold, um, I start right away with the what are factor graphs, right, the most important part. So factor graphs were introduced in 2001 by Xi Sheng. Uh, the definition is that a factor graph is a bipartite graph that expresses the structure of the factorization of a function. Right. This might become a bit more clear if I show an example of a graph that's from the same paper. Uh, so a bipartite graph, that means we have two different types of nodes. Uh, those are factor nodes, the squares, and variable nodes, the circles. And what the factor graph really represents is the notion of is a function of Right, so in particular here, the factor fa is a function of one variable x1. Uh, the factor fc is a function of three different variables x1, x2, and x3. Right, that's a very fundamental relationship between variables and, um, and functions or factors. And so with that very general relationship, we can use very general algorithms, such as the sum product algorithm. If you're not familiar with that one, it's a, it's a very powerful algorithm that covers a lot of different other things, and some of these I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, for example, belief propagation, Viterbi, Kalman filter, turbo codes, fast Fourier transform. So everything can be expressed in that form. So now the question is, why are these factor graphs relevant to robot perception? Right? In robot perception, we have a stream of sensor measurements coming in constantly. And then we want to infer certain quantities from that data. For example, we might want to ask, where is the robot right now? Or we might want to know, how does the environment look like? What can the robot do in that environment? Or we might want to know how many people are in the room. Right? So all of these things we can infer from the sensor measurements. And so the factor graph is useful not just for modeling these typical inference problems in robot perception, but also for directly performing inference. Uh, we can run algorithms that work on these graphical models and that give you the answer to an optimization or inference problem. More importantly, um, they have also proof, proven useful for developing new inference algorithms that are specifically tailored for the kind of problems we see in robot perception. They exploit the structure of the problem, both the spatial structure and the temporal structure of the problem. And we'll see a bit more of that later. So in this talk, um, I'm first starting with an overview of inference algorithms for factor graphs. And this will only be an overview at a high level. Right? The details, this would cover multiple talks. Um, but I provide references for where you can look if you want to know more details. Then the main part of the talk will be on two different examples of sla uh, factor graph applications. The first one is an example of localization and mapping for underwater robotics. The second one is on state estimation for aerial robots, in particular visual inertial odometry. And then as time allows, I will quickly run through a few other examples before concluding. So let's start with the inference part. Uh, for inference, we first have to set up a problem. We have to 
have a problem that's represented as a factor graph. And so here's an example. I use one of the most well-studied problems in robotics, which is simultaneous localization and mapping. So that's the problem of trying to localize yourself, or the robot, in a map that doesn't exist yet, that you have to create at the same time. So you're building that map, you use the map to localize yourself. So how does this work? The robot uses its onboard sensors to uh, uh, look at the environment, and let's see it. Let's say it sees a chair, right? This is uh, we call this a landmark. It's some kind of observation. In the symbols case, this might simply be a point of interest in an image, so something easily identifiable in an image. And then the, the the measurement would be the pixel location in the image, but it could be more generally the uh, the bearing and range to an actual chair, to an object. So now as the robot is moving through the environment, there's additional sensor information that it has available. It would use odometry to figure out how it is moving through the environment. So for example, wheel encoders might tell the robot that it moved one meter forward. From the new location, uh, the robot can again perceive the environment, might reobserve the chair from the beginning and see a new object uh, table here. Right. Now this really gets more interesting as the robot drives around the environment for a while. The reason is that sensor measurements are uncertain. So even from a laser rangefinder, laser rangefinder, the measurement it gives you, there's a bit of uncertainty included there. And so if you add up these uncertainties over time, you get errors that accumulate, so-called drift. And that means that the position that you estimate of where you are is going to be off. And that also means that the map that you're creating is off because it relies on that position estimate. So after some drift has accumulated, if the robot can now reobserve something that it has seen earlier because it returns to a place it has traversed before, um, then we get a new measurement here that we call a loop closure. There's really nothing special about the measurement. It's a normal sensor measurement, except that it helps us to eliminate the drift in the navigation. Right? So if the robot now sees that the table is a meter away from it, but the state estimate has drifted, and the robot thought it's five meters away from the table, then it can correct that drift that has accumulated. And it can also correct the intermediate poses, and it can correct the map that's associated with that, so any objects it has seen in the meantime. So that's the, that's the SLAM problem. And uh, now the question is, how do we do the computations uh, that give us uh, the answer if we incorporate such a loop closure that gives us an estimate for all of these variables? Um, so this is where we go to a factor graph representation on which we will then do inference. So the factor graph underlying this problem, uh, if you remember, factor graph was a bipartite graph. So two different nodes, variable nodes, here are the large circles, factor nodes, the small circles. Variable nodes are the quantities that we want to estimate. So in this case, they are the robot poses. And if we assume a 2D environment for now, for simplicity, that would mean it's XY position and orientation yaw. And landmarks are also variables, their position, so that's x and y in 2D. The factors mostly represent sensor measurements, constraints that are derived from sensor measurements. So for example, M1 here is an observation of the landmark L1 taken when the robot was at pose x0. Right. And so as I said before, this could be a pixel measurement in a camera image. There's one other type of factor node here. Um, that's the there's P here. Um, this is a constraint on the first post just to fix a coordinate frame because there's an ambiguity here. We can choose any coordinate frame. So for example, we can put the first post at the origin. All right, now the question is, how do we do inference on this? And as I said before, this will be at a very high level. So the, the factor graph corresponds to a factorization of a function. That function might as well be a probability density. So in this case, we factor probability density into individual components, each one corresponding to one of the measurements. And I'm not going to explain what that term exactly is, but it, it tells you what is the probability of a certain measurement. 
given that we know theta, which is all of the variables, poses, and landmarks. Now, this is kind of the wrong way, right? Because we don't know theta. Theta is what we want to infer. But that's exactly the problem of inference, right? We have to go backwards. If we knew theta, we can predict what's the probability. Now we try to maximize the joint probability of all of these measurements and find a set of variables that maximizes this. That's the optimization problem. So if we assume Gaussian noise for now, um, then this reduces to a least squares problem. In particular, it becomes a minimization of a sum of squared errors. And here I will explain slightly more what these terms mean. So for each of these error terms, for each of the factors, there's one of these error terms, we have the actual measurement from the sensor, ZI, that gets subtracted from the predicted measurement. And the predicted measurement comes from a generative sensor model um, that predicts, given the variables, given the pose and the landmarks position, what we would see in the sensor. So at which pixel in the image the, uh, the object would show up. And so the difference between these two ideally is zero, um, but it might not be possible because of noise in the measurements to find a set of variables that gets all of these errors to zero. So we want to get it as close as possible to zero, and uh, that is the least squares problem. So we try to minimize the sum of the squares of these error terms. So if we want to make one further assumption of that this generative model is a linear function, and that is typically not the case, like a projection into a camera is inherently nonlinear. Um, but if you have a nonlinear function, we can actually repeatedly linearize and solve repeatedly a linearized problem to get to a solution. So if we just look at the linear problem for now and look at how to solve this, the linear problem corresponds to a minimization of the square of just the linear function in theta, which is a theta minus b. In this case, a is a fairly large matrix, right? The columns of a have to be the variables in theta. So if we draw this matrix, the columns are the variables, poses, and landmarks. And the rows of this matrix are exactly the factors. So each factor corresponds to a row or a block row in this matrix. And now there's something interesting we get from the factor graph, and that is the notion of sparsity. Right? I said before that the factor graph encodes that the factor M1 is a function of two variables, x0 and L1. That also means that in the corresponding matrix here, the corresponding row for M1 will have only two entries because it's not a function of any of the other variables. So that means we end up with a sparse matrix here. And sparse matrix means there are efficient algorithms to solve this problem. Now, I'm talking about ma matrices here, but I actually wanted to do inference on graphical models. So let's go to graphical models, and this will be at a high level only. The details can be found in the corresponding papers here. So we can do inference on a factor graph in the following way. We can apply a well-known algorithm that's called variable elimination that goes through this graph one by one and converts it into a directed graph, a base net. Um, by construction, it's a special base net um, that has a special property. It's caudal. Um, and that means inside there's a, there's a tree structure hidden. So if we find cliques in that structure, the cliques will make up a tree structure. This structure we call the base tree. Um, and uh, if you have, if you have uh, learned anything about graphical model inference, then if you have a tree structure, that means you're basically done. It's very easy to do inference in there. Right? It's the, the hardest part is getting to a tree structure. So at this point, we can essentially read off the solution to the problem once we're there. But because this is a bit abstract, let me give an equivalent in matrix form. So if we take the matrix from before and do sparse QR matrix factorization, we get an upper triangular matrix. And that upper triangular matrix is actually equivalent to the base tree. It's the same kind of information is stored in these cliques of the tree than you can find in the R matrix. 
Um, typically, sparse matrix factorization is used to solve the problem in linear algebra. After this, you do back substitution and you have the solution. And so we can now do the same uh, on a graphical model. The difference is that the graphical model, the tree here, provides a better representation for the problem. The sparse matrix uh, is a compressed for, um, uh, data structure that is completely not suitable to doing inference. So if you realize that there's a tree structure behind, you can do much more interesting things than with the matrix itself. And in particular, you can incrementally update such a solution. So the robotics, pro uh, robotics perception problem is incremental, right? We have a stream of sensor measurements. So if a new measurement comes in, we could take all of the old measurements and the new one and perform inference over that. But that means we are recomputing a lot of the same things that we have computed before, just adding in the new information. So instead, we can update an already existing solution in the form of a base tree. So if we get a new measurement, a new factor, we can then identify the relevant part of the base tree that is affected by this update. We convert it back into a factor graph. We add in the new factor and then go through this whole process again of variable elimination to get to a base net, then click finding to get to a new base tree. And now the interesting part is that from such updates, Typically, only a small part of the tree is affected. And the other parts here, there's one subtree shown in green. They can simply be moved down here. They don't have to be touched at all. They get added back into the newly calculated, updated part of the tree. So this allows for an efficient way of incorporating new measurements. And in fact, this is also not new. Um, we can do this on matrices um, that corresponds to updating a sparse matrix factorization, for example, with Gibbons rotations, um, and, and this is well known. However, in sparse matrices, they represent a linear system, right? So this means you can update only a linear system incrementally. It turns out with these graphical models, you can actually update a nonlinear system. And uh, this is too much to explain in detail here, but at a high level, um, we can come up with an incremental nonlinear least squares algorithm um, that's based on this base tree data structure. And so in every time step uh, of an optimization, here you have a robot running around an environment. At every time step, only a small part of the tree, typically shown in red here, um, has to be updated. So this sometimes includes larger parts of the tree. If you have loop closures, then larger parts have to be updated, more variables are affected. But most of the time, it's a very efficient operation that operates very locally. And we can selectively relinearize variables in there. That means we can maintain a nonlinear system and incrementally update that. And this is something that's not possible in matrix form. Uh, and it's also not possible in the, the compressed made, uh, sparse matrix form that's typically being used. Um, this algorithm is available as part of GTSAM library, so if you want to play with it, this is open source. <clears throat> so this concludes the inference section. Uh, this was really at a high level to give you an idea what's out there, what's possible. And now I want to get to the main part of the talk, which is how do we use this to do localization and mapping with an underwater robot for inspection purposes? So underwater inspection is useful for many different things like ship inspection, uh, harbor infrastructure, energy uh, infrastructure inspection. Let's look at ship inspection in particular. If you want to look at the hull of a ship, um, you can take it out of the water and this is obviously quite expensive to do. You need the facilities to do it. For large ships, that's an effort. And most importantly, you take the ship out of service. And, and that's really expensive. So a few days of the ship not operating is expensive. So what if you could do this um, while the ship is in water? By simply putting a robot in there, and the robot is searching the ship hull, um, is building your model, is doing whatever you need in terms of taking measurements. Okay, so the question is, what kind of sensors would we want to put on that robot? Uh, let's put a camera on and try that out. So here's a camera image that was taken uh, in Boston Harbor 
Uh, the object that you see or not see here is about half a meter from the camera, so it's about when we run into the object. Uh, so this is probably not very suitable. In particular, if you go back to the factograph formulation, um, where are the landmarks here? So what could we identify as a landmark? Okay, maybe you can use a different spectrum. Um, how about infrared also? So as it turns out, visible light is actually uh, the least absorbed in water. So this is absorption in water for different wavelengths. And visible light between green and blue is about the best spectrum that you can use. So infrared is not a good option. So uh, RGBD sensors, or so typical sensors won't work well. <clears throat> so why does visible light not work? It's because of particulates in the water, right? If you have really clear water, uh, if you go to San Diego, which we do once a year for experiments for that reason, um, then it's actually not a problem. But in typical harbor environments and near the coast, sediment is steeled up, and that means there are particulates in the water and you can't really see anything. So radio waves would be another option, uh, but radio waves don't propagate underwater. So that also means we have no GPS available. So how do we localize the robot? So this is starting to become a kind of difficult problem. So it turns out in underwater domain, what's typically being used is acoustics, right, sound. Uh, and one typical way to navigate underwater is a DVL, is a Doppler velocity lock. And that's an acoustic sensor uh, that uses four different acoustic beams in different directions to measure velocity over the seafloor, velocity and direction over seafloor. So they send out an uh, acoustic uh, sound front and then wait for it to come back and measure the Doppler effect. And from the Doppler effect, they can figure out, um, and from the, from the four different shifts here, uh, from Doppler effect, they can figure out how fast and in which direction we move. This is usually combined with an inertial measurement unit as navigation solution. Um, so the inertial measurement unit gives you measurements of linear acceleration and angular velocity. And with this, you can keep track of your position. However, your state estimate will drift over time. The reason is there's no absolute measurement involved, right? All of these measurements are relative. And so this means, again, we have drift in there. We have small errors that add up over time to very significant navigation errors. And the, the question of how long it takes for them to add up is basically a function of the cost of these sensors. If you spend a lot of money on these sensors, then you might have an hour or maybe even a few hours before your state estimate becomes unusable. Uh, with very cheap sensors, it's in the range of minutes or seconds even. All right, so that means we need some additional information to get, uh, to get rid of drift. And so the equivalent of a camera underwater is a sonar. With a sonar, we can get acoustically images of the environment. One specific type of sonar that we use for this application is profiling sonar. Uh, that operates a bit more like a, laser, one, a 2D laser range finder than a camera, so it gives you a slice through the environment. Here are some examples. The sonar is located at the bottom, looking up at the structure. Uh, in this case, the prop of a ship, uh, the part of the hull of the ship, and the bottom of the ship. One thing that you can see here is we have significant noise, and that noise comes from the way that the image is being formed. The image is formed using a phased array of transducers, so essentially you have a microphone array, you send out some acoustic waves, you wait until they come back, um, the time gives you the range, and the timing at which time they arrive at the different receivers gives you the direction. And so from this you assemble the image together, and that means there are some situations where you cannot disambiguate where the sound came from, and that's where such noise arises. And also here, unlike a laser range finder, we actually get multiple returns in range, and that's because the acoustic beam is not as focused as a laser beam. Um, so typically here we have a one degree opening and so at a few meter distance uh, that's a significant uh, deviation. So this sensor is often used for bathymetric mapping, so seafloor mapping. If you point it down you can get an idea of how the seafloor looks like. Um, 
but we use it to point it at an object and be able to create 3D models of the object and then use that for localization. So the question is, how do we do that? Thinking back to the factor graph, we need landmarks, right? Where are the landmarks here? If we look at the center one, there's really no distinct point or anything. In fact, even if we have a CAD model, a 3D model of the ship, this would not tell you where you are. It might, might limit a bit the places where you could possibly be, but it is not sufficient to localize. So we have to do something more intelligent here. And what we do is we create submaps. We accumulate several scans over a short time frame into a small map. And that map provides us more information that allows us to uh, um, do SLAM with. So the idea here is that the, that the navigation sensors provide low drift over 10 to 30 seconds. Right? In that time frame, the error is in a millimeter range. While if you do this over 10 minutes, then you'll be off by many meters and it won't be usable. So over that time, short time frame, we simply accumulate as the sonar, as the vehicle with the sonar is moving, we simply accumulate multiple scans, multiple lines, into a surface or point cloud representation, and that's our submap. We can now create a factor graph that has a pose associated for each of these submaps. Um, the pose represents, for example, the pose of the first scan line that was taken in the submap. This is kind of flexible. And then we use the dormitory measurements, which is what the navigation system of the vehicle tells us how far we moved between the two poses as a dormitory. And again, we have some prior posts here to fix the reference frame. Good, so now we can do inference over this and what will happen? Actually, nothing will happen. Um, so if we optimize this, there isn't any more information than what the navigation system gave us, meaning we'll get exactly the same poses that the navigation system would have told us where we are and that's drifting over time. So we need some additional information and uh, that we can get from loop closures. But there are no landmarks here. So what do we do here? We register, cross-register maps. So if the vehicle comes back to an area that it has previously scanned, if we have overlap between two of these submaps, so these, for example, look very similar, but a bit different, they were actually taken from a different angle, different position a bit. Um, so we can register these together and we can figure out what's the difference between the two sonar poses that observe those. And that will give us a loop closing constraint between these two poses. It will give us the offset between these two poses. And that again allows us to eliminate drift. So this graph is also called a pose graph because it only involves poses and constraints between poses, no landmarks. And that's also frequently used outside the water um, to reduce complexity of optimization problems uh, because you don't have to explicitly model landmarks. All right, so now we can optimize and we will actually get a better solution and hopefully we get a number of these constraints over time and then our map will be accurate and localization will be accurate. But for the underwater domain, there are a few more things to consider. In underwater, we actually have, we can use a pressure sensor to determine our depths. So the depth estimate is not drifting. We have an absolute measurement. It's noisy, uh, it's relatively accurate. You can do this to centimeter accuracy, um, but it's still noisy. Similarly, pitch and roll, we can derive from an inertial measurement unit uh, that can measure, essentially measure gravity direction with some noise, especially if you're accelerating. Um, but it, it does not drift. So this means we only have drift in three degrees of freedom, x, y, and orientation in the plane. And we can represent this in the graph by only having x, y, and yaw as relative odometry constraints, adding absolute constraints on the other three measurements. Um, and for the loop closing constraint, we have a choice. We could do 6DOF, but often the information in these surfaces is not sufficient to even do 6DOF alignment. So we would also use the priors additionally and potentially only get three degrees or even less for some surfaces. Like if you look at a planar surface, you can really only constrain uh, your, I guess, X and Y can shift arbitrarily. 
<clears throat> so now that we know how to do this, we can assemble our robot together with the right sensors. Um, this is the platform that we use for this, a hovering autonomous underwater vehicle that has a sonar in the front that creates these images, has a Doppler velocity lock, the acoustic sensor that looks down, and for good measure, we also added cameras on here. Um, in fact, there's a stereo camera on now and another camera on top and on the current platform. Um, so if we have good visibility, we can also use those. So the only thing missing is water. Um, and that's why the water tank went up out there. Um, so there's a, a tank for doing some local testing. It's actually relatively small for, for doing experiments, um, but we can do some basic experiments in the lab here. Uh, it's relatively small, but still quite big. It's 130 tons of water, quite significant. So for real testing, we have to go out in the field. Uh, and these are some of the most recent tests that we did, the ships that we went for inspection. Um, and I've, I've, uh, we do this at least twice a year, typically. Um, and uh, what I told you is only one part of the story. It's for the complex area of the hull. For the non-complex area, there's a way to cover it much faster, cover the ship much faster. Um, here you can see how the experiments actually go ahead on a boat um, when we have to modify the vehicle or repair something on the fly. So here are some results from this. Uh, this is a bit an artificial result from a, a long ship where uh, you can see the submaps in different colors. Um, and we had the vehicle go along the ship and then come back again. We would typically not do it this way. Uh, but this tells you the drift that accumulates over that time. And uh, the drift here is then corrected by having these cross constraints that are also visible here, the same in top view. Uh, this is done actually in real time. That means hopefully we never have such big drift before it's corrected, right? It's constantly corrected and hopefully we don't drift too far from the correct solution. Uh, here are some other examples. This is a bit more um, what we would typically do, um, which is uh, complex areas of the ship, creating a model for that. Um, but we also went further to uh, more complex structures. These are pilings and up here. Uh, by the way, these are very large structures. That's 17 meter here diameter. Uh, the prop here is six meter diameter. So they are um, which quite fill the auditorium here. Um, so here we have one other problem that comes up. For the ship, we can manually script what the vehicle should do and have some interaction we basically have an operator looking at this and, and changing some parameters, and we can, we can do these kind of missions. Here, if you go into this maze of pilings, um, you quickly lose context, and for example, the tether of the vehicle, you'll probably wrap around some piling, and, and that's the end of it. So what we really need here is some automatic planning. The vehicle needs to figure out by itself what to do. And this is a bit more recent work in my lab. We typically don't do planning. So what we did is we looked at the state of the art in planning. We took state of the art and tried to apply this here. So how well does this work? Uh, first problem is the maps that we create are useless for the planner. Right, the surfaces, the planner doesn't care about. The planner cares about free space information. So this is typically done using an occupancy map. So you partition space here in 2D, but you can do the same in 3D with voxels, into cells. And for each cell, you figure out, is it free, that's white here? Is it occupied, black? Or is it unknown, that's the gray area? Um, so we can create an occupancy grid map, that's fine. However, the question is, how do we incorporate loop closures? And so the current state of the art in planning doesn't do that. They basically accept that there will be drift that will corrupt the map. Um, so here there's supposed to be a rectangle, but because of drift it's, it's off. Um, and that the map is not as good as it could be. But it's not connected to the state of the art on the mapping side. So our submap representation actually provides a way of getting around this problem. Right? We can represent the free space using small occupancy grid maps for these submaps. So each submap now is not just the surface, but it also includes free space information. And now as we get a loop closure, these submaps can simply shift around. 
right? We just anger these submaps at the pose of the factor graph, and as we optimize, they move. Problem is still how do we connect this to the planner? The planner needs to see a single occupancy grid map. So our proposal was a virtual global occupancy map. Uh, and this, by the way, is going to appear in, in IROS in a few days. Uh, this was work by Bing and Paloma, um, who are probably in the audience. Paloma is here. Um, and uh, the idea is if the, uh, we, we provide a virtual occupancy grid map to the planner, so the planner asks for a specific voxel if it's free or not. We can now look up in these submaps, uh, maybe multiple of these overlap, we combine the information and figure out is that space free or not. And so this way we can combine SLAM with planning. Um, this is still preliminary, obviously this uh, was using a next best view planner and that doesn't take the tether into account, for example, among other things. Um, so there's more work to be done. Uh, the overall system looks like this. We have the vehicle providing sonar data and odometry. From this, we create the submaps. The submaps are connected to the post graph that determines their position, their location in space. And then the path planner can query the virtual occupancy grid map, which will look at the local submaps to figure out um, if places are free or not. So we've integrated this and we've tested it in simulation so far in the tank. Uh, field testing of this is upcoming. Um, so from simulation, here we took, a, we took an actual model from a, a prop, um, used this as ground truth, and then simulated data, simulated sonar data, noisy and noisy vehicle odometry, um, and then have the baseline next best view planner running over it with a, with a drifting estimate uh, versus our system. And yellow, you can see the errors. So you can see we have less error in the model at the end, which means a more accurate model, which means the planner can do a better job. But we have still have to do this at larger scales. OK, so that concludes the underwater section. Um, the next part that I want to talk about is even more fundamental than the SLAM problem. It is state estimation. It's simply knowing where are you at the current time, not how the environment looks like. Um, and in particular, we'll look at visual inertial odometry. So here we have a, a quad rotor uh, that's taking off, that's just outside the auditorium here. Um, you can see the raw sensors, accelerometer and gyros, and the camera images, and we want to combine these together into a, a state estimate, uh, which yields this trajectory here over time. So where is the vehicle at a given time? Now this is odometry, not SLAM. So we don't maintain a global map. We only care about the most recent state. And that means we will have drift in there. But the goal is to minimize that drift and then maybe use the output of that as input to a SLAM system later. OK, so that's a very fundamental algorithm, not just for robotics, but also mobile devices, VR, AR, right? If you just take a camera and an inertial sensor um, and somehow calculate their position estimate over time. Why do we use these two sensors? Because they are very complementary. So the camera allows us to continuously calibrate the IMU. Right? The camera, you would calibrate ahead of time and you're done. An IMU has temper um, has time varying calibration parameters, so they have to be recalibrated on the fly. Um, and that can be done using information from the camera. And the more accurate that calibration is, the better the information from the IMU is. So that's really important. On the other hand, the IMU also works when the camera fails. For example, if you look at the textureless surface or if you have motion blur because of fast motion, the IMU will still give you useful information. And at least over short term, you can integrate this without calibration and you still get a good state estimate. All right, so now the question is how to do this. So here's what we did before with SLAM. We took the whole history of information and accumulate this. This is called smoothing or batch optimization. And it would look something like this here. Um, 
This thing gets a bit more complicated here than before. The state estimate is not just this psi here, which is the pose, position, and orientation. We also have to estimate velocity to make this work, and we have to estimate the biases, the calibration parameters. So instead of six degrees of freedom, we now have 15 degrees of freedom per pose. Uh, that makes things more complicated. We also estimate landmarks in this case. Um, so that's the point features that the camera is tracking and that helps us with calibration and everything. So the problem with this is that if we add, uh, we have to do this really fast. So the state estimate for quadrotor we need at a few hundred times per second. Right? Camera images come at, let's say, 30 times per second. So at least at 30 times per second, we have to add a new pose here. That means this will quickly get too expensive to do in real time. So the typical way to do here is to use a fixed leg smoother. That means we only include in the optimization the last few poses. And the more poses you can include, the better your state estimate will be, but also the more expensive it will be. Extreme cases, only one pose. That's what you would do with an extended Kalman filter. That can also be used here. Uh, but that doesn't give as good a solution as you can get otherwise. So fixed leg smoother, for example, we look at the last n here four states, and we maintain that over time. So question is how to do that. You could simply cut off the history, but that means you throw away all prior information. That actually yields a really bad state estimate. That's not usable. So instead, we have to do this right. We have to do marginalization. We have to correctly integrate out the previous state. So marginalization in a 2D example, 2D Gaussian density. Um, here's our Gaussian density uh, with samples drawn from it. Um, it's parameterized as a mean in alpha and beta, two variables. We have a covariance matrix. And now we want to marginalize out alpha. That means we essentially project this distribution onto um, the, the beta axis. Right? And we get a new distribution that's now one dimensional and that contains everything. In covariance form, that's very easy to do. We can simply use this block here, sigma beta beta, and that contains all the information we need to marginalize. However, we exploited sparsity. Sparsity is not in covariance form, but in information form. The covariance matrix is always dense. The information matrix is the one that's sparse. So information is simply the inverse of covariance. And in information form, we can also do this marginalization, but we have to do something that's known as a sure complement. So we have to do some calculation there. But it's not a problem to do. The problems come up if we go to more than two dimensions. In three dimensions, here's an example of, a, of an ellipsoid in three dimensions, and we now want to project it. We want to get rid of um, one dimension Z here, marginalize out, and get a resulting distribution over XY. At this point, it's helpful to look at a corresponding factor graph that encodes the sparsity. So these are information matrices. Um, so they encode here that um, Z and X have a measurement in between, while there's no measurement between the other two. Uh, y is, would be connected to other variables around here, but that's not relevant. So if we do marginalization here, we end up with what we expect, uh, two-dimensional uh, covariance, uh, uh, Gaussian. If we do the same here, where we added an additional measurement between Z and Y, then after marginalization, something surprising happens. We get an additional edge in here shown in red. So while originally these two entries between X and Y were empty, there was no measurement, no correlation between them. Correlation is wrong. No direct measurement between them. Now we have a direct measurement, or we have an implied measurement between them from the marginalization. So this is destroying sparsity, and that's a problem. So um, that creates fill-in, so additional entries. Um, and for that, we have to look at the variables connected to the variable that we marginalize, so z, which in this case are x and y. That's the so-called Markov blanket, and all of these will get connected together. All right, so if we look at this in terms of uh, our uh, smoothing, we start with a sparse matrix, 
and it quickly becomes dense in the fixed leg smoother. So this means that this is now really expensive to do and difficult to do at 300 times per second. Or basically, uh, 30 times per second. So basically impossible to do in real time. Because we have hundreds of variables in here. We have hundreds of landmarks typically. And the lag here hopefully is 10 or 20, something meaningful. So question is, how can we get around this? What does the state of the art do? The state of the art does two different things. Both of those are not great. One is we discard measurements so that we don't get the fill-in in the first place. Right? If we didn't have the measurement between Z and Y, which yielded a fill-in, then we actually don't get fill-in. So we drop measurements before we marginalize, but that means we lose information, and that means we get a less good estimate. The second solution is we marginalize more variables than we need to, and then we have to reintroduce those again, including their associated measurements. But that means we now have used these measurements multiple times, and that means we get an inconsistent state estimate. So we get a wrong solution. Is there a better way of doing this? So let's look at the marginalization process. What actually happens is we have our original system. We have a new incoming state here in green. And at this point, we want to get rid of the oldest state to keep the number of states constant. What we do is we take this Markov blanket. That means all the variables connected to these three that we want to marginalize. That's all the ones shown in red here. We take that out. We perform marginalization, which creates the fill-in. Um, and then we could reinsert this here, but that's a problem. So fill-in, by the way, can be seen here as a factor that connects to many variables, right? We like factors that connect to few variables because that means sparsity. If there are hundreds of landmarks connected to this, that's bad news. So then the question is, can we somehow um, enforce a sparse structure onto this? And that's called sparsification that process. So we have this target distribution, which is the dense one, and we want to approximate it by a sparse distribution that retains the original sparsity. And in fact, you can do that. Uh, we've actually done this a few years ago in the context of SLAM. Uh, in SLAM, you have the problem that these graphs grow arbitrarily. In fact, for, in the context of ship inspection, um, this came up. And so what we did is we marginalized uh, variables that we don't need anymore then create fill-in, and then remove that fill-in by sparsification. So the same idea with some new insights uh, based on others that build on this paper here, um, we can apply here. And we end up with an optimization problem. Right? We try to optimize a kohlberg leibler divergence. Um, this is essentially a measure for how similar two, distribu two probability distributions are. We try to minimize that distance and therefore find the closest approximate distribution to the target distribution with some constraints to make sure that we have a consistent state estimator at the end. So overall, this process looks the uh, following. We can extract the Markov blanket. We do marginalization. We get this dense factor. We then sparsify to get the same kind of structure that we had originally. Um, and then we reinsert this here. Because it is the same structure, we can do this recursively, and we will not suffer from any fill-in. Right, so this means it stays sparse, and we can solve this efficiently. All right, so the advantages are preserved sparsity. And comparing to the state of the art in the field, we preserve all of the measurements. But of course, we have to do some approximation in there, so we do lose some information. Um, and all of the variables remain optimizable, so we don't have to remove variables and add them back in again. We have implemented this on real hardware. Um, this was on two different drones, flown uh, using stereo camera and IMU. Uh, you could do the same thing with monocular. It's a question of the front end. The math is actually staying the same. The back end is the same here. Um, we took the quattro the inside the building. This was hand carried through the building, uh, but also outside for flying. So here are both results, uh, indoors and outdoor, uh, taking off from the sports field. 
You can see a reprojection of the point features in the two images and also the horizon here. <clears throat> and this is tracking the state as the, uh, as the quadrotor is flying. And in fact, we've done this closed loop also, so using that state estimate to fly the quadrotor. <clears throat> So this gives us a qualitative evaluation. We can have the quadrotor land in the same location and then figure out how far did the state estimate drift. But we can also use um, uh, data sets with ground truth that allow us to evaluate how good the algorithm actually is and compare it. So here's an evaluation of absolute trajectory error in red uh, and lower means better compared with the other state-of-the-art algorithms. And as you can see, in many cases, we perform better than the state-of-the-art. In some cases, not. So the hypothesis here was that our front end is not as good as the front end of others. And Jerry did just yesterday, oh yeah, this is, by the way, Jerry's uh, work. Uh, he just recently graduated with masters. Um, this will appear also at IROS in a couple of days. So Jerry did, yes, as of yesterday, got results from a common front end between Oquis, so using Oquis's front end with our back end. And now we can directly compare the methods and we consistently perform better on this. This was one on Monte Carlo simulations to try different kinds of environments. <clears throat> All right, so we've introduced a new algorithm for state estimation that's more accurate than what's been out there. And it's again by looking at the math, getting the math right, and doing this based on factor graphs. So factor graphs have been a major factor in here. So as time allows right now, I will talk about briefly about a few other examples uh, before concluding. So for the underwater domain, I brought up profiling sonar before, but there are also other sonars, imaging sonar, that are more similar to a camera. In this case, um, we uh, have an ambiguity similar with the camera projection, right? We, in a camera projection, you lose range information, but from multiple camera images, you can recover 3D geometry, that structure for motion. So similar with sonar, in sonar you get range, but you lose the Y component in the image. Uh, but from multiple images, we can recover the 3D geometry. Now, it turns out that this is a bit different uh, from structure for motion that the problem is um, very non-Gaussian underneath. And so Eric Westman, who's working on this, came up with a much better solution recently that's really different from structure for motion that uses a non-parametric solution locally for solving that deals with non-Gaussian densities. <clears throat> Another example here, talking about non-Gaussian densities, we can do, we can use the same mechanism, factor graph, space tree, to not do inference over Gaussian densities, but something else. For example, using kernel density estimates of arbitrary distributions. And so we end up with a non-parametric um, uh, solver that can solve problems um, that, for example, have mixtures of Gaussians in them. Now, these problems are completely intractable, right? Even for relatively small problems, the complexity, the number of, of theoretical modes in the solution exceeds, far exceeds the number of atoms in the universe. So there's no way to get an exact solution for this. But we can get an approximate solution at reasonable time, not exactly real time. Um, and this is something we did in this work here. Um, mapping with point features, structure for motion is the usual way. But we can also use planar surfaces to do the mapping. Like we can use infinite planes instead of points. Um, they also have, they have three degrees of freedom, uh, so very similar to point features. Uh, the advantage is there are not too many planes to have to be estimated. So that means we don't have to go back to a postgraph to do large scale mapping. We can actually do the structure for motion way where the planes are now the landmarks. And with this, uh, Ming and Eric have been um, mapping here in the building, also combining this with inertial sensors. Um, again, represented as factor graphs. Um, some work from other people outside from our group. Uh, this is a paper I just saw that will appear in IROS, a robust sensor fusion with self-tuning mixture models. Uh, so they took uh, the factor graph model and they added in 
essentially kind of calibration parameters to automatically tune a system. So here an example they have is using GPS measurements, which are, not, which are notoriously difficult to integrate, um, and then automatically learning. And so instead of getting these red traces for trajectories, you get the green traces at the end. <clears throat> Another example from Byron Boots at Georgia Tech is combining the uh, SLAM part with planning. Right? SLAM is looking at the past, planning is looking at the future, but it's really one optimization problem. Um, so steep here, simultaneous trajectory estimation and planning. <clears throat> Another example um, from uh, Matt Walter um, uh, was and, and, uh, um, and Stephanie Telex um, was um, semantic understanding of maps, so adding semantic understanding. That helps with two things. Number one, it can improve your maps. You can figure out when you make mistakes or you can add additional loop closures in. And number two, it can be useful for queries from natural language and again represented using factor graphs. And so I think that's the last one. Um, occupancy grid mapping, that's by uh, John Corso at Michigan. Um, this is looking at a different way of doing occupancy grid mapping where you don't consider each of the cells independent but you look at the neighborhood to uh, get a better estimate of the maps and so you can get more accurate maps than with traditional methods. And again represent by a factor graph and then doing different kinds of uh, optimizations on that. So after this overview, I want to quickly summarize. So hopefully I convey to you that factor graphs are a very useful model um, to represent uh, robot perception problems. Um, I also show that new inference algorithms will build on that that were not possible beforehand. And I talked about a number of different applications from SLAM to state estimation, calibration if you include the IMU bias calibration. Uh, but you can also calibrate cameras and so. And then even planning uh, done by other groups. Um, and I'm sure there's much more to this over time. Future work that I see right now, um, robustness is a major issue. So if the front end in these methods fails, right, if you get the wrong correspondence thinking that this point feature is the same that you saw before, but it's actually not, um, that creates big problems in the optimization later. So. There's one way is combining the uh, more tightly integrating the back end and the front end. Um, but another way is in the, in the back end itself dealing with non Gaussian density. So, non Gaussian inference in general is relevant there. Then, I think at the intersection with planning, there's some really interesting work to be done because it's not really clear what the right representation is that we should even use at that intersection. Um, and that's Representation will also influence algorithms on both sides and how to do the, both the, the mapping and the planning side. If you want to learn more about these methods, um, I will again teach robot localization and mapping in spring. Um, there's also a, a very long uh, journal paper out from Frank Dillard, my thesis advisor, and myself on factor graphs for robot perception in foundations and trends in robotics that overviews all of these methods. Um, and finally, I want to acknowledge um, all the funding agencies and companies that supported that work to make it possible. The collaborators, both here at CMU and at other universities, and in particular, the many great students that have worked on this over the years and that actually implemented it, made it work, and wrote up the papers um, to publish it. Thank you very much. <laughs> <clears throat> so one, one possibility would be to include estimating wind into the system. Um, if, 
If there is just a bit of wind, so I don't see it, it wouldn't affect the IMU and it wouldn't affect the camera measurements that you get. Um, if it's big gusts, yeah. So you would want to in, you would want to actually estimate us. Um, that actually can also be done underwater for estimating currents. Um, that increases your state space, so that makes things more expensive, but is is doable. Yeah, um, incorporating into the uh, into the state, so that means your state would now additionally model the wind. So it would have a way of explaining these discrepancies from the IMU uh, that don't agree with the vision side. So I, I actually have not done much on the deep learning side. Um, I really like the geometric methods. But, but there are a number of places where um, we, we actually don't know how to solve things geometrically. So one thing is getting features from sonar images. Um, there, there are a lot of good tuned features for vision, but not for sonar. So this is, these are places where, where uh, deep learning makes sense. Um, there, might be, there might be other places uh, where at that intersection there it, might, it makes sense to, uh, to do walk between deep learning and geometry. Um, but maybe with a bit different methods than what are currently being used. Yes? In, in this classification, uh, I don't understand like, uh, so where exactly is the constraint of sparse P? Mm. <coughs> so we, uh, um, we essentially provide a structure of the factor graph, um, and that means the functions uh, that would represent uh, these constraints. And then the optimization will find the, the means and covariances that go into these, into these functions. And there's a big question, how do you choose these functions? Right? We, we chose that from what we think it should be, but this might not be the best possible solution. Even the structure might not be the best possible solution. It would be interesting if you could optimize the actual structure. Um, we haven't figured out how to do that. So we simply provided the framework itself and then just the optimization fills in the numbers still. Yes? So I was wondering uh, if we can include hard constraints in this optimization. Mm. So that, that is a good question. The, the first post where we put this prior on, that's kind of a hack to avoid a hard constraint. Right? We could simply say that first post has to be at the origin rather than put a Gaussian on it. Um, but if we do this, we end up with a constrained optimization problem that's more challenging to solve. Um, however, there has been work, I believe, from Frank's group on uh, um, incorporating constraints into the optimization and still solving afterwards. Um, I don't know if you can do this in the incremental setting also, or just in the batch optimization. But that, that is a good question. And in, uh, sorry, say again. Oh, I see. So, so how to create keyframes or how to figure out one to? Uh, oh, or com adding a constraint that they are supposed to be the same. Um, yes. So, so the question is, if um, if you visit an area often, right? You add new poses all the time. Um, so we have done some work in the past that's called reduced post graph, where you would reuse previously created poses and transfer the measurements onto those poses. Um, there's some linearization errors in that, um, but, but if you're nearby the poses, you can, you can do that. And you essentially ma maintain a post graph with a constant number of poses per unit area, um, but you can still add new measurements in. So, so that's possible. If, if you would just add a constraint between the poses, then you still have both in the optimization, which grows the optimization problem. 
Other questions? Yes. Yes. So you still have to linearize in the base tree, but you don't have to recalculate everything. You can selectively choose variables that deviate from their linear, that estimate deviates from the linearization point, um, mark them for relinearization, then identify which parts of the tree are affected. That's typically a bit a larger part than just from the from new factors, um, and then recalculate that whole block, and in that process do relinearization. Um, but that can still be done incrementally, while in the matrix form, it's, it's not clear how you would do that.